go forward and look a little bit more at the progressive era in a, another slide um show so that'll be added to after you know this will be that'll be sent as a separate uh, video um so we came up through the 1900s we'll talk about the progressive era in another video but for this time we're going to talk a little bit about uh, federalism so you know we're going to explain the basis of american federalism here we're going to talk about the necessary and proper clause and how it relates to american federalism then we're going to analyze different periods of federalism in american history so federalism is a is an issue or a, a, a system of government where you have the same territory that could be controlled by two or more levels of government in the united states we have federal state and local governments and they all have powers the federal government has some very specific powers that are delegated to them through the constitution these are going to be called enumerated powers or delegated powers right so we can all maybe take a look at this and we see federal state and local and they kind of act independently but with some pressure from the federal government at times. And we'll look at some of the things such as mandates and stuff like that. So we look at a few of our enumerated powers in the constitution, you know, things like laying taxes, um, punishing piracy and felonies on high seas and offenses against the laws of nation, uh, regulate commerce, coin money, establish a post office, a lot of the stuff that we talked about last week. The state responsibilities here in the United States, in California, and we we'll use California as an example, are to conduct elections. The Secretary of State here in California will set up the elections and they will give a kind of a little bit of guidance to the local governments to run the elections. You know, we have a registrar of voters in each county and they, they are the ones that that will will run the elections here they can lay taxes uh they can uh, help run federal programs like unemployment unemployment is a federal program that is also administered by the state using federal tax dollars as well as state tax dollars and uh it's a a a, a thing if you you lose your job by no fault of your own you can apply for unemployment and get paid a, you know uh you know i think the max is 450 dollars a week um but that money comes from taxation. Uh, Medi-Cal, which is a low-income health insurance, is the same. The federal government, along with the state, will contribute to a fund to run the Medi-Cal system, and the, the state will put in the requirements, and they'll push the duties of you know, eligibility, determination, and enrollment onto local government. So if you ever needed to go and get uh, apply for Medi-Cal, you would do it online, and I think you go to a one of the county offices to kind of have your interview. Uh, CalFresh is also known, more commonly known as food stamps or EBT. Uh, again, this is federal dollars used. You go to the county and apply for it, run through the state. They also uh, run schools, motor vehicle registration, and the courts. Remember, we're going to have two very, two clearly defined court systems. We're going to have the federal court system and the state court system. And we're going to get into a discussion of that and talk about that a little bit more later in the class. If we look at local government duties, uh, a lot of local governments are responsible for parks and rec, uh, police and fire. So, uh, you know, local government will provide police protection as well as fire protection. And I kind of glossed over parks and rec. Uh, they will, uh, you know, kind of run the parks system and recreational programs, uh, which are vital here in, you know, for, for young people and for uh, maybe people that want to do some type of activity. They also get engaged in housing services. Um, Emergency medical services. So the city of San Diego will engage in a contract with an ambulance company to provide, uh, you know, ambulance services, uh, transportation that could be something like buses and trolleys. Uh, you know, you know, some cities in different parts of, of, of the county of San Diego will have their own, uh, you know, mass transit system. And we obviously have the trolley in some parts of San Diego and public works. So if there is a pothole that needs to be filled, or if there's like some type of problem with the sewer system, the County Public Works Department will handle it. So we look at this as a real world example. We have the federal government, the state government and local government. Under local government, we have county, city and smaller municipal governments like school boards and stuff like that, right? Now, when we talk about, you know, kind of confidence in state and local government, 
Uh, at times, people will have more trust in local government and state government than in the federal government. And we can see the numbers here. And why is that so? I think, uh, you know, it's easier to, to kind of recognize the fact that local government officials might be easier to be uh, easier, easier to access than maybe a state government official or a federal government official. If I go down to, uh, I live in Chula Vista, I go, if I go to the city of Chula Vista and try to talk to my council person there, if they're there, it might be a high probability that I could uh, go and see them, right? Or talk to them personally. They're among our, they're in our community and they usually campaign and, you know, they're present in the community, whether that's at some type of, of maybe memorial or some type of dedication or whatever. State government and local governments are a little bit different. They're a lot more harder to access. So I think that's probably one of the main reasons that local government is viewed more favorably, right? There are more than 86,000 types of government here in the U.S. and most of them are going to be on the local level. Like I said, school boards, water districts, city councils, board of supervisors. So when we kind of talk about federal power, uh, the constitutional power and federal and state authority, the Constitution lists 18 specific powers that are delegated to Congress. And states and local governments can't engage in those powers, right? If you click on that link that I have right here, you could go ahead and see what the delegated powers are. I'm not going to go over them because I don't expect you to know every single one. We went over a handful. There's going to be 18. Among that 18 is something called the Necessary and Proper Clause that we'll talk about. Uh, for the most part, by the 10th Amendment, um, states and local governments can make laws as long as they don't conflict with our individual rights now can these laws conflict with state law can state laws conflict with federal laws yes and we'll talk about that in a minute so the 10th amendment which is the final amendment in the bill of rights gives the uh gives powers not delegated to the united states by the constitution nor prohibited to it by the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people what this basically means is that states can pass laws separate from the federal government as long as they do not they do not violate the constitution but if a federal law and a state law conflict Federal law will trump state law. This is due to that supremacy clause in the Constitution that we talked about last week. Article 6, paragraph 2 is simply referred to as the supremacy clause, meaning that our Constitution and our federal law will take precedent over state laws and even state constitutions. If we look at a real-world example, Prop 64 in 2016 legalized marijuana or cannabis for recreational use. Currently, marijuana is is illegal under the federal law there is something called the controlled substance act of 1970 which was passed by the nixon administration which put marijuana as a scheduled one narcotic if the government wanted to come in and shut down all of the dispensaries in california arrest all the growers and arrest maybe the people working at the dispensaries as as uh, as uh distributors uh they could possibly do that because federal law trumps state law. Now, are they going to do that? I don't think so. I really doubt. I think they would have done it by now already. But remember, marijuana is still a Schedule One drug federally. So federal law outweighs state law. So in a sense, marijuana is still illegal at the federal level. But since we have the 10th Amendment in this, California can have this, which is voted based off of an initiative that we saw in last class, um, it is certainly within the power of the federal government to come in and shut down the dispensaries. It's just a matter of will they do it or not. And both the Obama administration and the Trump administration have not done that. And we don't. I don't think Biden's administration will do it either because I think Biden is. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of kind of a lot of thought in the federal system that we need to decriminalize uh, cannabis as well. But we'll see where that goes. As part of. Uh, the powers that Congress has, one of the other powers is the necessary proper clause, right? And this came out of a case called McCulloch versus Maryland, where it uh, the court gave Congress the power to expand their kind of uh, expand their powers to include maybe something that is implied, an implied power that might help them accomplish one of the enumerated powers. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But this came out of an issue where we had a court case where the, the, the state of Maryland tried to 
charge the federal government four hundred thousand dollars in taxes um, to run a bank in there. Um, but since it was found that you know creating a banking system had, even though it had not been expressly enumerated in the Constitution, it still fell within Congress's implied powers. So we look at the necessary and proper clause that says to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or department or of or officer thereof. So basically, if a government can fit something, uh, if the government is going to pass a law that's not specifically mentioned in the Constitution, can Congress do that? Yes, if they can rationalize that, what they are doing is to execute one of those delegated powers. Problem is, these enumerated powers are really broad, so you can pretty much fit anything into it. So Congress has a federal statute that issues a tax. Congress can do that because taxing is a federal enumerated power. Federal spending, yes, enumerated power. Uh, when enumerated power isn't enough to validate a law as constitutional, Congress can add that that elastic clause or that necessary and proper clause can be used to broaden Congress's authority to enact a law. And we're going to look at a real world scenario in a minute. But as part of this, in order to be able to use the necessary and proper clause, you have to be able to justify the means of the goal. Right. And it kind of goes in in conjunction with that classic Machiavellian type thought where the ends must justify the means. Right. So your end game in the law that you are trying to pass has to be has to justify that goal. Right. It can be used as a broad authority to enact the law so long as the means reasonable relate to an end. So your ends must justify your means. Right. And there's a case called U.S. versus Comstock, where I think it was one of the more interesting cases that this was determined uh, to be appropriate. So I don't know if you guys, some of you guys may be younger than I are. I know a lot of you are younger than I am. There's a gentleman named John Walsh who used to have a TV program called America's Most Wanted. I don't know if it's still on. I still think he does stuff for victims' rights. But his son, Adam, was murdered by a repeat offender. Right. And on the 25th anniversary of Adam's death, Congress passed the Child Protection and Safety Act. And what this did was it organized sex offenders into three tiers, where tier three was the more serious than tier two and then tier one. This required states to comply with the statutory scheme under which states are required to modify their registrations in accordance with federal requirements. So states had to adopt this as well through a directive from the, go the federal government. And if you go here in California, there's a website called Megan's Law. And if you look on Megan's Law, there's going to be a listing. And if you check your address, there's going to be a listing of potential via, uh, offenders that live in your area because they're required to, to register. And if states did not implement this system that was in compliance with the federal law, with the Adam Walsh Child Safety and Protection Act, they would risk losing 10% of their law enforcement assistance funds that are given by the federal government. So you can also see that there is a bit of coercive federalism here, which a term will, will address in a few minutes. Um, one of the more controversial parts of this law is that this law also gave the federal government the authority to hold someone accused of child molestation past their release date if the Fed still believed that their person is a danger to society. So federal law allows the courts to order the civil commitment of a mentally ill, sexually dangerous federal prisoner beyond the date they would have been released. And this is 18 United States Code Section 4248. What does this all mean? If a judge has an inkling that somebody has engaged or attempted to engage in a sexually violent conduct or child molestation in the past... If they suffer from serious mental illness, abnormality, or disorder, and as, as a result would have difficulty refraining from acting out on that, they could be civilly committed, even if their sentencing date is up. So say there is a person that is put in prison for five years. Um, if When that five-year release date comes up, if the judge, along with medical professionals, feel that that person is not suitable for release, they could still civilly com commit them. There is due process according to this. A hearing is available to the involuntary committed individual every six months where a psychiatrist and a judge get together and discuss whether or not this person is rehabilitated more. Uh, and if they haven't, they'll be put, they'll, they'll still be kept in, in, in custody. Uh, 
Graydon Comstock had finished his sentence and was to be released. He was incarcerated for three years following a, a conviction of possession of child pornography. He was not released as he was civilly committed and still considered a danger to society. He argued that that law violated his constitutional rights. And the Supreme Court found that the Congress did not exceed their power due to that necessary and proper clause. In a 7-2 vote, Thomas, Clarence Thomas, and Anton Scalia, who is no longer with us, both dissented. The question was, and what does this have to do with federalism? Uh, does Section 4248 infringe on state police powers? It was found that it didn't because state police powers is a source that is derived from the Tenth Amendment, which reserves all powers not expressly delegated to the federal government for the states. The United States argued that Section 4248 doesn't infringe on states' police powers because these people are already in custody. They're already in federal custody anyway. So we talk about the, the legal, legal reasoning in this. It was just a rationally related and reasonably adapted law that helped execute one of those enumerated powers. And if we go back, uh, let's see right here. Right here, this is the enumerated power that it was found to fall under. Offenses against the law of nations. So let's go back. So I think this is a really interesting case. Now let's kind of talk about the evolution of federalism here in the United States. Now if we talk about dual federalism, we've seen that in a period from 1791 to 1901. This was called layer cake federalism, and we'll look at, at the differences of this. Uh, during the first 110 years or so of our nation, states and, and federal government shared powers, or I mean divided most powers. Uh, the national government would concentrate on those delegated powers that we looked at, and states would decide the more important domestic policy issues. Now, we also have something called cooperative federalism that happened from 1901 to 1969. Uh, marble cake federalism, right? Both the nation and the states exercise responsibility for welfare, social welfare, public health, highways, education, and criminal justice. Um, you know, the federal government will provide grant and aids to help states run, you know, policing, uh, education, and they'll kind of also work together with things like highways, right, or freeways. An example of cooperative federalism is that the federal government will get tax revenue from, from all of us and give it to states to fund interstate highways, right? The states, and we'll use California as an example, California has Caltrans, uh, which kind of oversees the maintenance and, 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 uh, the construction of, of freeways. So if there's an interstate that passes through multiple states, uh, the federal government will fund any repairs or anything that needs to be uh, maybe added to those freeways or interstates, uh, but they'll have the states do the work. And here in California, it is called Caltrans. So looking at this, uh, you could see uh, the difference seen in, in uh, you know, layer cake federalism versus marble cake. Layer cakes, we have programs and authorities that are clearly divided between the nation, state, and local governments. And then on the right, we have marble cake federalism where we have a mixture between the na national, state, and local governments and how they their programs and authorities are mixed. You know, kind of past that, then we started to see uh, the evolution of a new type of federalism, where a lot of our problems that we had at the time were declared to be national problems, like the war on crime, the war on poverty, the war on drugs. So, uh, you know, kind of coming out of, you know, the, the, the New Deal era and, in, in, you know, the great society programs that LBJ put into place, uh, we started to see a new approach to federalism, where we started to see a lot of powers that were... Uh, transferring out of the federal government and going back to the states. You know, it kind of happened, you know, during the New Deal where you saw a lot of programs being pulled from the states and give to the federal government to run. Uh, but, you know, kind of the opposite happened here. Uh, Nixon and Reagan, who are a couple of the more cons more conservative presidents that we've had, felt that the government collects the taxes and then they share a small part of them with state and local governments who are a little bit more knowledgeable about identifying day-to-day -day needs for that money. 
Uh, Reagan also proposed greater flexibility and use of federal funds to allow state and local officials to exercise more control over the programs and the projects that they run. So a uh, really kind of a way of maybe taking some of the powers out of the federal government and giving it back to the state and local governments. Now, we also have a concept of something called coercive federalism, right? There's federal mandates that the, the federal government will have direct orders to state and local governments to perform a particular activity in order to comply with federal law. No monies are provided and the state and local governments, as well as at times private businesses, have to comply with this by use of their own money. One of the things that is really a uh, you know, a good example of this is the Americans with Disabilities Act. So the Americans with Disabilities Act is a federal law that requires states, local governments, as well as private businesses to provide accessibility for people with disabilities. And it's going to be on their own money, right? So a couple of things that can kind of come out of this is that if states and if local governments and if private businesses don't comply with this, they can face a, a fine from the federal government. And also they could potentially be looking at a lawsuit. So there's a lot of things that kind of can come in and encourage a state, local and uh, government and private business to comply with these federal mandates. And, you know, uh, the Ameri the afford um, uh, the patient affordability and American care act, uh, uh, Obamacare uh, is another one. Um, the Affordable Care Act uh, is also a federal mandate, but we won't necessarily get into that. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But I think the Americans with Disability Act is a very good example of a federal mandate. So we talked about tax dollars coming out um, and they come through grants. So we have a block grant, which refers to granting aid of, the, of a specific amount of money from the federal government that has to be that could be used for a broad purpose. So the federal government will collect tax dollars and then give it to state governments and tell them, you know, you can use it how you want to. And they're used to fund law enforcement, maybe some type of social service, public health, or a community development project. These block grants will have less oversight, and states and local governments will have more flexibility in, in using these. Kind of different than what we call a categorical grant. Right. Categorical grants are grants that are issued by Congress and they have to be used for a specific purpose. I always like to use the, the, the example of Head Start. Head Start was created in 1965 as a summer school program to help low income students kind of get ready for transitional, you know, kind of that period between pre uh, pre, between preschool and kindergarten, kind of giving them a way to be ready for kindergarten. Um, the federal government provides money to run this program, but it has to be used for Head Start. It can't be used for anything else. So we have a block grant and a categorical grant. So, you know, coming to a conclusion on this, this lecture video, uh, we've seen different levels of government. We talked about the Necessary and Proper Clause. We reviewed the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act and its tie-in to federalism. We analyzed the different periods of federalism in history, and we looked at block grants and categorical grants. Okay, uh, go ahead and take a look at the other videos for the week and we'll see you soon.